Hey, first of all, let me thank uh, those who helped organize our churchwide picnic yesterday. We had a great time. We had a great time. I want to especially thank our, our women's ministry, Kathy Smith and our women's ministry, and Eric Howard and our men's ministry as they led the picnic. I don't know how many people were there. It seemed like we had about a thousand people there yesterday. It wasn't quite that many, but we had a lot of people. And so uh, if you didn't participate, we'd encourage you to, to come the next time. We're beginning to do more and more church-wide activities, and we do that so that we can fellowship together. Church Church isn't just coming to church on Sunday morning, but it's being the church, and being the church means that we spend time together. So I want to share a couple of blessings. Last Sunday, I asked you to pray specifically for three individuals, three members of our ministry team that were going through some health crisis, and I want to give you an update on all three of those. So we asked you to pray for Margaret Ryan, who was in the hospital last Sunday. Uh, she thought with chest pains, and so we rejoice that her heart heart tested out perfect. Margaret's here somewhere. Where's Margaret? She's around here somewhere, and so uh, all the way in the back. So she said, said she's got the heart of about a 20-year-old, and so I'm not sure whether that's true, so we rejoice in that. Secondly, we asked you to pray for Ricky Santiago, who's Pastor Jose's son, who had had a seizure, and they weren't sure exactly what was going on, and he tested out absolutely fine. They found no issues there. They said they thought it was just from dehydration and being tired, so no major issue there. We rejoice in that. And we asked you to pray for little Jaron, Darren and Jaquetzia's uh, little boy who had major surgery on Wednesday. And we are rejoicing over this as much, if not more, than the others because little Jaron had a deformity in his left diaphragm, which caused his left lung to collapse, which caused all of his organs to move over. And from an x-ray point of view, it didn't look good, and we didn't know exactly what was taking place. And so when the doctors went in, they didn't know exactly what they were going to be dealing with. And so they found out that the diaphragm had a hernia. They were able to fix the hernia. They were able to put the diaphragm back in place. Within a day, the left lung expanded to normal size. And Jaron was supposed to be in the hospital for seven days. On Friday, he came home. And so we rejoice in that. And so thank you so much for praying for them. So I'm I'm convinced of the fact that because our theme this year is pray believing, that God is going to be testing us over and over and over again. And so uh, God proved himself faithful as he always does. And obviously, even if all of those things wouldn't have gone as we wanted, God would have proved himself faithful. So let's continue to pray for one another. Take your Bibles with me today and turn to the gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2. So, I don't know about you, but I love watching movies or reading a book with a good plot twist. Anybody else with me on that? By, by plot twist, I mean a, a surprise ending or an unexpected outcome. Something happens in the story that you didn't see coming, and it blows you away. I'm a, I'm a John Grisham fan. I'm not sure whether anybody else is a John Grisham fan. And I recently read John Grisham's new, uh, and they call it his new electrifying book. That's how Amazon promotes it. His electrifying book, The Reckoning. I'm not sure whether you've read it or not. I recently read it. And in The Reckoning, John Grisham has a completely unexpected plot twist at the end of the book. Do you want to know what happens at the end of the reckoning? No, you got to read the book. You got to read the book. I'm not going uh, to tell you. Well, today's passage that we're going to study has not one, not two, but it has three different plot twists in it. You might sit back and say, Brian, do you mean to tell me that the Bible is that exciting and yes, it is. In the passage we are reading, there are three things 
that happen that the people involved in the story didn't see coming, and three things that happened that you and I as a reader don't expect either. So I want to read through the passage. You follow along. See if you can catch any of the plot twists in the passage. If not, we'll make reference to them during the message. So we're in Mark chapter 2, beginning in verse 2. Follow along. We'll put it up on the screen. And when he, when Jesus returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. And so this is the, probably the only mention of Jesus at his home. He, he, he lived, he, he obviously was, was born in Bethlehem, spent some time in Nazareth, but as an adult, he lived in Capernaum, which was on the northern side of the Sea of Galilee. And this passage says that he was at his home, and many people believe that he actually lived with Peter, that Peter had a bigger house, and Jesus probably had a room in the second floor of Peter's house. So as we get to Mark chapter 2, Jesus had been away on ministry and comes back to his house, and he's there at his home. Verse 2, and many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. The story, by the way, is found in all three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and Luke tells us that many of the people there were scribes and Pharisees. They were religious leaders. They had come from Galilee. They had come from Judea, and Luke even says that many of them had come from as far away as Jerusalem for the purpose of hearing Jesus teach. So here's Jesus in his home or in his room teaching, and the room is so packed that people are literally standing in the door and outside of the door. Verse 3, and they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. So, So rooms packed, Jesus is teaching, here come four men carrying a paralytic, a man who's paralyzed, maybe a quadriplegic or a paraplegic, and they come carrying him on a bed to Jesus. Verse 4, And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He's blaspheming. For no one can forgive sins but God alone. And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, why do you question these things in your heart? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed and walk, but that you might know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. By the way, the phrase or the name Son of Man is Jesus' favorite term for himself. He uses it repeatedly throughout the Gospels. He said, so that you might know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Then he looks at the paralytic and says, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose immediately, picked up his bed, and went out before them all, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we've never seen anything like this. Would you pray with me today? Lord, thank you for uh, our folks. Some of them, I'm sure, are tired. We didn't get as much sleep as we're accustomed to on Saturday night, and yet all of us are here for a purpose. We love you. We want to worship you. We want to hear from you this morning. So, Lord, I pray that you would open our ears and open our hearts. Help us to not only hear the story, but more importantly, I pray that you would help us to hear from the Holy Spirit of God. I pray for those of us who are here today who are in need of forgiveness. Help them to realize that we serve a loving, compassionate, tender God. Jesus, the Son of Man, who desires to forgive us. I pray for those today who understand the forgiveness of God, but they haven't forgiven themselves. 
And Lord, on a regular basis, they beat themselves up and they have not experienced the freedom and the grace that is available through Jesus Christ. Lord, help us to understand today the healing of forgiveness that is found only in Jesus. And it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. So, last Sunday, we began our series that we simply have called Journey to the Cross. And um, we saw that, that, that this is not a journey in which we're going to travel from one location to another. Not at all. For the next seven weeks, we're going to travel with Jesus as Jesus obviously journeys from Galilee to Jerusalem and he journeys to the cross. And our goal obviously is not to literally walk with him. Maybe one of these days we'll take a Holy Land trip and we'll walk the route that Jesus walked. Our journey is not to do that, but rather to allow Jesus' physical journey to the cross to mold and shape us spiritually. Here's what we're praying as a leadership team. We're praying that God does something in my life. We're praying that God does something in your life these next seven weeks as we make our way towards Easter Sunday. And we're praying that this year Easter is, is uh, different. It's, it's more exciting. It's more explosive in our lives as God prepares our hearts and our minds and our lives for what he wants to do in our midst. We talked last week that, that, that many people call this journey Lent. And we defied this uh, we define this journey in this way. It's a spiritual journey in which a follower of Jesus unclutters his or her life in order to focus their heart on Jesus. And I want to encourage you during these next seven weeks to unclutter your life. I'm not sure what that means in your life, but maybe it means to slow down and spend more time with Jesus. Maybe it means to, to turn the television off and, and open up your Bible. Maybe it means to wake up early in the morning. Maybe it means to not spend time on Facebook and spend time with Jesus, but unclutter your life to focus your heart on him. Last Sunday, we were in Mark chapter 1, and we saw that because of Jesus' position as the eternal Son, we are able to enter into a relationship with the Father. Today, you and I are sons and daughters of God, heirs of God, joint heirs with Jesus Christ because of the relationship that Jesus has with his Father. We saw that because of Jesus' victory over Satan, you and I can have victory over sin as well. We do not have to be constantly defeated. Jesus has already won the victory over sin, and we can experience that. And we saw that because of Jesus' kingdom ministry, we were able to serve as kingdom citizens. Well, as I mentioned in today's passage, Jesus is at his home in Capernaum. As I, as I alluded to, many believe that he lived in Peter's house, and his room was probably located on the second floor. Luke tells us that people came from all over to hear him preach the word. The room was packed, so much so, uh, Mark says, that there wasn't even room at the door. When all of a sudden, four men show up unexpectedly carrying a paralytic friend. This man was totally disabled. He wasn't able to walk, most likely wasn't able to move. The simple truth is that he couldn't get anywhere on his own, let alone up the steps to the second floor where Jesus stayed. The text doesn't tell us how far they traveled. Maybe they were neighbors of Jesus there in Capernaum. Maybe they came from a, near, a, near, a nearby village. The text doesn't say. We do know that they climbed the stairs to Jesus' room, and they weren't deterred by the fact that they couldn't get in to Jesus' room. Rather, they simply carried him up to the roof, and the text is very specific. It says that they literally tore apart the roof and lowered him down to Jesus. Could you imagine? Here's Jesus in there. There's a crowd of people, and all of a sudden, somebody starts tearing apart the roof. And then all of a sudden, here comes a man on a bed or on a cot who's being lowered right in front of Jesus, and they lower him down, and they lay him at Jesus' feet. That is exactly what was taking place. Now, when you think about it, this probably wasn't the first time that these guys had transported their friend somewhere. 
They probably had carried him to the doctor before. They probably had carried him to different healers before. They loved their friend. They were concerned about him. But on this day, with conviction, they carry him to Jesus, realizing that Jesus is the only one who could heal him. I sat down and thought about that and thought, man, what a tremendous example for us. Pause with me for a second. Because all of us here this morning, I'm sure, have friends or family members who are suffering. Do we not? Think through your list of family and friends. Rarely is there someone in our congregation who doesn't know someone, who's not related to someone who isn't suffering. So think of the people that you know and what they are going through. Some of them probably have physical ailments. Others have emotional struggles. Others have problems in their family. And others maybe have financial issues. As a friend, you want to help them. As a friend, you want to assist them. And so we ask ourselves as friends, what can we do as as family members? What can we do to help those whom we love that are facing the struggles of life? And I put that in your outline today because I think this is the first and it's the most simple point in our passage, but it's so very true. As a friend of someone who is sick, as a friend of someone who is dying, as a friend of someone who is emotionally hurt or emotionally wounded, listen to this, your primary responsibility is to what? Is to take them to Jesus. That's exactly what these four guys did. They looked at their friend and said, listen, we want to help you. What can we do to help you? Why, Jesus is in Capernaum. Let's take him to Jesus. I would submit to you today that there is no greater act of love than to introduce your friend or your family member to Jesus Christ. I'm afraid that we're often quick to give physical, financial or even emotional help, but I'm afraid that we're often slow to introduce our friends to Jesus Christ. I guarantee you if we took a survey today and we went one by one from left to right or from right to left across our auditorium, almost every one of us here today knows someone who is struggling and you would love to help them, and you can. The best way that you can help them is by taking them to Jesus. You see, in Jesus, there is no greater friend. Or in Jesus, there is no greater counselor. There is no greater healer. Church, church, I want to pause here for a second because I want us to get a burden. I want us to have the conviction of these four guys that we read in the passage today who were so burdened, who were so convicted with their, for their friend, who knew without a doubt that the one person who could help him was Jesus. And they didn't let distance, they didn't let weight, they didn't let second floor, they didn't let a roof keep them from taking them to Jesus They were determined, and they took their friend to Jesus Christ. So these four guys bring the paralytic to Jesus, and that's when we experience our first plot twist in the story. These men lower their friend, and so you can imagine thinking, what in the world's going on? And all of a sudden, this, this man is just being lowered, and he's lowered right to the feet of Jesus And Jesus looks at him, and he says something completely unexpected. Jesus looks at him, and he says, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now, now as I read this, I tried to imagine how somebody from South Florida would respond to the situation, all right? And so let's just imagine we have a room full of South Floridians that, that, that see this, this crippled man who cannot walk, and he's lowered in front of Jesus, and Jesus looks at him and says, son, your sins are forgiven. I imagine most of us would sit back and say, okay. That's good. (laughs) Stubby in? Is that all? (laughs) Jesus, is that all you're going to do? 
Anybody with two eyes can see that this man can't walk. Anybody with two eyes can see that this man has an external need. Jesus, I think it's fantastic that you've forgiven his sins, but Jesus, what about his paralysis? What about his inability to walk? Anybody with two eyes can see that there's more of an immediate problem here. And here's what I want you to see. The point of the story is that Jesus would look at you and I and would say, no, there's not a more immediate problem. Jesus addresses the most immediate problem. You see, in Jesus' mind, he, he would say, listen, you think that if you walk again, all of your problems are going to be resolved. But just being able to walk does not resolve all of your problems. You sit back and think that if, that if I will take care of your financial situation, then all of your problems are going to be resolved. Or if I'll restore your marriage and I'll put you as a husband and wife back together then, then everything's going to be good. And Jesus said, that simply is not the case. Here's what Jesus says, and it's the second point in your outline. Here's what Jesus is showing. To Jesus, a spiritual need is much more important than a physical need. Catch that, church. That's so important as we look at this passage. To Jesus, a spiritual need is much more important than a physical need. Jesus is saying something so profoundly important. Here's what he's saying. No material prosperity, no physical condition, no career success, no human relationship, nothing is more important than having a right relationship with God. That's what Jesus is saying in the passage. Did the man have a problem? Absolutely he had a problem. Did the man need to be healed? Absolutely he need to be, needed to be healed. But Jesus was able to look at the situation and Jesus was able to see what the man's greatest need was. And his greatest need wasn't to learn to walk. His greatest need was to have a right relationship with God. Here's the truth, church. We look on the outer appearance. We can only see the external, but God looks on the heart. God sees the internal. You, you and I see the physical, but God sees the spiritual. You see, in this story, Jesus reminds us that the spiritual always trumps the physical. Always. The most important thing that God wants for you, moms and dads, the most important thing that God wants for your kids, the most important thing that God wants for your family members and your acquaintances, the number one priority in his life is their spiritual condition. Are they right with God? Now, I don't want you to get the wrong idea. Jesus is not being insensitive to this man's physical needs. We read the rest of the story. What does he do in just a few moments? He heals him. So Jesus isn't looking at him and saying, okay, your sins are forgiven. God bless you. Hope you can find a wheelchair somewhere and live a good life. That's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus meets the man's physical need. But Jesus is saying, listen, there is something more important than this man's physical need. Jesus is not promoting an ancient Gnostic Greek approach that the body is worthless and the soul is the only thing that counts. Jesus is not saying what happens here on earth doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is that people are going to heaven. That's not what Jesus is saying in the passage. Jesus is saying the physical is important. The world we live in is important. But as important as the physical is, it is not near as important as the spiritual. It is still not man's primary need. I would say this today. You need to have your sins forgiven. 
You need to have a right relationship with God. It doesn't matter today what you do for a living. It doesn't matter today how much money you have in your bank account. It doesn't matter today how wonderful of a husband you are or how wonderful of a parent you are. It doesn't matter whether you're a part of your neighborhood association and you're helping all of your neighbors. All of those are wonderful, fantastic, terrific things. But Jesus is saying this, every single one of us need to have our sins forgiven. We need to have a right relationship with God. Jesus says it this way later on in the Gospel of Mark. He says, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and to forfeit his own soul? Okay. Can I rewrite that verse? And I don't want you to think that I'm being uh, crude or hard, but I think we could say the word, the, we could say that verse this way. What does it profit a man if he's able to walk, but he forfeits his own soul? We could translate that a variety of ways. What does it profit a woman if she gets a fantastic job, but she loses her own soul? Here's what Jesus is saying in church. We have to grasp this because we are lights in a dark world. We are witnesses to a world who desperately needs Jesus Christ. And we need to understand that in God's eyes, the spiritual is always more important than the physical. We need to be concerned for those whom we love. Do they have a right relationship with God. That leads us to the second plot twist in the story. As you read through the story, you might have caught this. If you caught this, come and talk to me afterwards. I'd love to have a conversation with you. So as you read through the passage, you notice that Jesus forgave the man's sins without him asking for his sins to be forgiven. Did you notice that? So the story very simply is they tear open the roof. Here comes this bed down, and Jesus looks at him. The text says that the four men didn't say anything. The man in the bed didn't say anything. And Jesus immediately looks at him and says, Son, your sins are forgiven. Jesus forgives this man's sin without any confession. Jesus forgives this man's sin without any repentance. Now, now, as I read that, there were like red flags that went off in my mind, you know, ah, 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 wait a second. How can Jesus, what's going on here? How can Jesus forgive this man's sin? He didn't repent. He didn't confess. He didn't fall before him and say, be merciful to me. I'm a sinner. He just kind of lays there and Jesus says, son, your sins are forgiven. Listen, I know enough Bible to realize that there is not one place in all of Scripture that God forgives someone who doesn't repent. Yet here in this story, this man is lowered in a bed, and Jesus looks at him and says, son, your sins are forgiven. I sat back and thought, what's up with that, all right? Is there something here in the story that, that I'm just not catching? Because Jesus acts contrary to his nature here in this passage. What is up with that? And here, here's what I came to realize. The solution is found in verse 8. Would, would you jump with me to verse 8 in the passage? Because the solution is found there in verse 8. It says this, and immediately Jesus perceiving in his spirit that they questioned within themselves. Verse 8 draws you into the last part of the story, and it's actually talking that Jesus perceives the thoughts of the Pharisees who were thinking these wicked thoughts about him, but it also clearly explains what happens in the first part of the story. And here's what I want you to catch. Part of Jesus' power is that he is able to read thoughts. 
Jesus is not only able to read thoughts, but Jesus is able to see through this physical veneer that we have, and Jesus is able to understand our longings. Jesus is able to understand our motives. Jesus is able to understand what we are searching for, what we are longing for, without us even expressing it. Does that make sense? So the third thing I put in your outline, and I want to I wanna unpack it this morning, is this. Jesus is able to see the condition and the longing of your heart. So, so there's a bunch of things that are happening in the story. So not only does Jesus read and hear, and we'll see it in a second, the what these Pharisees were thinking because they were thinking negative thoughts about him. They never expressed it, but Jesus was able to perceive their thoughts. And so if Jesus was able to perceive the thoughts of the Pharisees who were thinking incorrectly about him, he most certainly could perceive the thoughts of the ones who were thinking correctly about him. He could perceive the thoughts of the ones who rejected him, and he could perceive the thoughts of the ones who accepted him. Why is that? Because Jesus is able to see the condition and longing of your heart. I wish we had time to walk through the New Testament because there's two or three other occasions in the New Testament in which Jesus does that. He looks at a person and he tells them what they were thinking before they ever verbalized what they were thinking. So how does that relate to us? Here's how it relates to us this morning. Jesus knows exactly what is in your heart right now. Jesus knows exactly what you're thinking. He knows exactly why you came here this morning. He knows what you are longing for. He knows that what you're thinking. I mean, he knows whether in your heart you're sitting back thinking, man, that Pastor Brian's just a fantastic preacher. A lot of you guys, I'm sure, are thinking that this morning. Or he knows whether you're thinking, I wish this guy would shut up really fast, all right? He knows what you're thinking. He knows if you came here today with a desire to meet with God's people or whether you came here today because someone else drug you. He knows whether you're paying attention this morning or whether you're doing something else on your cell phone. He knows exactly what you are thinking this morning. He knows the longings of your heart. He knows whether you and your heart think that you need him or whether you think you're independent without him. He's omniscient. He knows everything. And you and I cannot keep anything from him. Just a couple of verses, Psalm 94 and 11, the Lord knows the thoughts of man, that they are but breath. The word breath means that they're futile. 1 John 3, 20, for whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart. Why is that? Because he knows everything. I think I've told you this before. When I was growing up in Northeast Ohio, there was this television show called Captain Penny. I've talked about this before. But Captain Penny, I used to watch it as a little boy, and Captain Penny would end every single show with this statement. Vicki, make sure I get it correctly because she says I mess it up sometimes. All right, so he would make this statement. You can fool some of the people some of the time and some of the people all the time. But he would tell us, little boys and girls whose eyes were fixed on the television, he would say, but you can't fool mom, is what he told us. And I used to sit back and think, he doesn't know I can fool my mom. I've fooled mom a lot of times. Here's the truth of the story. You can fool some of the people some of the time. You can fool some of the people all the time. But you cannot fool God. Did I get it right, Vic? Did I mess it up again? I messed it up again. What what is it? You can fool some of the people all the time and some of the, all the people some of the time, but you can't fool God. Right? Are we right right there? All right. Vicky's going to put that on social media at the conclusion of the service, the correct way to say that. All right. Here's the thing. You can't fool God. He knows what you're thinking. He responds in two different ways in this story. And in the first place, he responds with tenderness to the ones who are longing for grace and mercy. 
You see, so, so, so once again, I know, so, so, so Jesus leans down, and the word that he uses as he heals, as he forgives this man's sin is very interesting. So he reaches down, and, and he tells this man, and there's no indication that he ever met him before. He reaches down, and he tells him, son, your sins are forgiven. Your translation might say, child, your sins are forgiven. The Greek word that is used there is the Greek word technon. It's one of the most dearing, endearing, compassionate words in the New Testament. Jesus doesn't look at, down at him and said, okay, dude, you're, your sins are forgiven. Get up and get out of here. He speaks to him with tenderness. He speaks to him with love. He calls him his son. And I wish we had time in Mark chapter 5, Jesus does the exact same thing as he heals someone. And in Mark chapter 7, he does the exact same thing as he heals someone. We know that Jesus can heal just by the word of his mouth, and we'll see it in just a few moments. But notice how many times in Scripture he actually reaches out to someone and he gives them a loving touch, that he shows love, that he shows tenderness to them. He could have just thought it, he could have just said it, and it would have been done, but he doesn't. He shows tenderness to whom? to those who are longing for grace and mercy. So Jesus' response to this crippled man was not against his character. He wasn't violating any theological premise by granting this man forgiveness of sins without repentance and confession. Jesus knew his heart, and he knew that in this man's heart, he was seeking God. And as a response to that, he says, son, your sins are forgiven. There's a different illustration in the passage as well because the actual verse 8 is talking about the response of the Pharisees. Because the Pharisees, after they heard Jesus say that, the Pharisees sat back and said, whoa, ho, ho, ho. what's happening here? <laughs> what's happening? Who is he to forgive sins? We know that only God can forgive sins. And you know what? The Pharisees were exactly right. Only God can forgive sins. They were missing the point completely. As I read through that story, I wanted to write one word beside that. I wanted to write the word, duh. <laughs> because the Pharisees were saying, wait a second, who is he? Only God can forgive sins. And that's the exact point that is being made in the passage. Jesus says later on, I did this so that you know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. But how did Jesus respond to them? Jesus responded to them with authority. So Jesus responds with authority, loving authority, but never less authority to those who question his deity. There's a third plot twist in the passage. Let me mention it. It's found in verse, in verse 8. So after, after the Pharisees questioned within themselves and Jesus called out their thoughts, what they were perceiving, Jesus makes this statement. It's actually in verse 9. Jesus says, which is easier to say to the paralytic? Your sins are forgiven. Or to say, rise, take up your bed, and walk. You see, the Pharisees were hung up on Jesus declaring the forgiveness of the man's sins. And, and, and Jesus is basically saying, one is not any more difficult to say than the other. Here's the fourth thing. Let me give it to you, and then we're going to flesh it out. The fourth thing is this. Jesus' power to forgive sins was based upon his future sacrifice. Jesus' power to forgive sins was based upon his future sacrifice. One theologian said this, and I'm going to dive into this just for a little second, and then we'll back away, and if you're interested, we can talk about it later. But one theologian said this, that forgiveness of sins was the only problem that God ever faced. 
I think he said actually it was the only dilemma that God ever faced. Now, I know in, in reality that God never faced a dilemma, and I believe that God solved that in his mind in the Trinity before the world was ever created. But here is the supposed dilemma. Because of God's justice, because he's holy, because he's right, he is compelled to punish sin. But his love, but that violates his love. Because of God's love, he would randomly love to just forgive everybody, to just walk through and start right over here and say, all right, I now since forgiven, now forgiven, forgiven, and just randomly forgive everybody. God would love to do that, but that would violate his justice. And so there is, a, there is a theological tension in the New Testament between the holiness of God and the justice or excuse me, the holiness of God and the love of God. And there is only one way that that is resolved. That is only resolved through the cross of Jesus Christ, where Jesus comes and through his sacrificial death becomes the mediator for all of that. Paul says it this way in Romans chapter 3, I believe it's in verse 26. Paul says that God is able to be just and at the same time the justifier of those who have faith in Jesus. The answer to the dilemma of the forgiveness of sins is the cross. It's the perfect life of Jesus, his sacrificial death, and then his resurrection. I say that because as Jesus forgives this man's sins, he is not just randomly forgiving his sins, but he is forgiving his sins based on the future work of his on the cross. Because he knew that he was going to pay the price for sins. Three more quick truths, then I'll give you some applications and we'll be done. The first is this, Jesus' words are the demonstration of his power. Jesus' words are the demonstration of his power. That's why I believe and others think that the most important word is the word say. Because Jesus says this, I actually underlined it, which is easier to say to the paralytic? Which is easier to say, rise up, take up your bed and walk? Why is that? Because Jesus, they are, they are equal. Why is that? Because the words of Jesus are the demonstration of his power. Thomas Ward, the theologian, said this, when it comes to God, his words are his deeds. Amen. Think with me. Genesis chapter 1, he said, let there be light. And after saying, let there be light, he didn't go over to the Trinity and said, okay, now let's go over here and make some light. No. When he said, let there be what light, he what? He spoke it, and there was what? Light. <laughs> let there be day and night. He spoke it. And it happened. When it comes to Jesus, his words are his commands. I was reading in, in Hebrews yesterday. Vicky and I were reading and we were praying through some things. And, and I talked about this verse. Let me just read this. I didn't put it up on the screen. In Ephesians chapter 1, in verse 3, it says, He is the radiant, speaking of Jesus, of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Let me just pause there for a second. If I can give you any, or I can't give you any greater reason to get in God's word. Why is that? Because God's word are the demonstration of his power. He looks at this man and he says, rise, take up your bed and go home. And the text says, it's really interesting. It doesn't say that the man kind of slowly, I mean, this guy hadn't walked I mean, I mean, his feet didn't know what it was like to support weight. His knees didn't know what it was like to support weight. You would think that this guy slowly would stand up and get the kinks out of his right leg, and then the kinks out of his left leg. That's the way we get up in the morning, isn't it, Mike? We kind of kind of get up and get the kinks out of our legs. You think this is way that what the guy did? But he says, no, he did what? He immediately got up. Why? Because he was already healed. Jesus healed him when he spoke the word. He was already completely healed. Oh, man, church, Jesus' words are the demonstration of his power. 
What does it matter if I say your sins are forgiven or if I say rise up and walk? I speak and it happens. My words are my power. Here's the second thing. Jesus' power to heal is connected to his power to forgive. Jesus' power to heal are connected or his, his power to heal is connected to the power to forgive. You and I know that sickness and death and grief and trial and the problems that we go through are the result of sin. And by the way, the Pharisees had an erroneous thought that every time a person had a problem, that they had that problem because they sinned. Remember the man who was born blind and the Pharisees said, okay, Jesus, who sinned? This guy or his parents? Somebody had to sin. And Jesus said, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? This man was born blind so that, the, that, that he might demonstrate the glory of God. We have a tendency, by the way, don't ever sit back and look at somebody going through a problem and sit back and think, boy, I wonder what they did. All right, I wonder what problem they went through. All right, specifically we can't do that, but overarching, yes, pain and death and sickness are the result of sin. Romans chapter 8 tells us that really clearly, and we're looking for the day when all of that will be eliminated. So Jesus is sitting back saying, forgive sins, heal a paralytic. They're connected because Jesus' power to heal is directly connected with his power to forgive. There's one final little tidbit here. The last is this. Jesus can accomplish both the visible and the invisible work in your life. One of the problems that the Pharisees had is Jesus said, your sins are forgiven, and they didn't see anything happen. <laughs> I mean, they probably wouldn't have had the argument if all of a sudden Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. And all of a sudden, all the sins the guy ever committed just fell out on the floor. And they're sitting back saying, oh my word, look at all the sins that guy committed. Man, we just saw Jesus forgive all of his sins. Maybe they wouldn't have had a problem that way. But Jesus did something and they're sitting back saying, I don't see any different. <laughs> I don't see any different. Jesus did an invisible work in him. And it wasn't until Jesus looked at him and said, okay, rise, take up your bed, and go home, that they were visibly able to see the power of God in his life. Hey, hey church, here's what I want you to catch. God is equally able to do both the visible as well as the invisible in your life. That ties back to what we said, that God desires to do the spiritual in your life. And that spiritual isn't always immediately manifested publicly. Lord willing, it will be manifested publicly as he changes your life. But God wants to work in you just as much as he wants to work on the outside of you. He's able to do the invisible as much as he can do the visible. And I would ask this and I would pray this, that the Holy Spirit of God is invisibly working in your and my life to the extent that that change is taking place from the inside out and the invisible one day becomes visible to a lost and dying world around us. I'll give you a couple applications and I'm done. I didn't put these in your notes. Make you do a little bit of work, all right? Application number one, please catch this. God's grace is greater than your sin. God's grace is greater than your sin. In a crowd this size, I know I've been in ministry long enough, in a crowd this size, I know there's somebody that's sitting back saying, but Brian, you have no idea what I've done. Brian, you have no idea the thoughts that race through my mind. You have no idea what my past is, and I don't, and I don't have to, but God does. And God's grace is greater than any sin you or I could ever commit. Reach out and trust His grace. 
Hey, if God could take the Apostle Paul, who was a persecutor of the church, who was a murderer, and God would, could take him and transform his life and allow him to be the vessel that God used to write at least half the New Testament, what can God do with your life and mine? Paul is a testament to the grace of God. And by the way, so are you today. You're a testament to the grace of God. It doesn't matter what sin you've committed today. It doesn't matter how many sins you've committed. It doesn't matter what atrocities that you are hiding in your life today. Remember, you can't hide them from God. He loves you. He cares for you. And he desires to show his grace in your life. Reach out to him for forgiveness. Here's the second thing. It ties right in with that. You can trust the tender heart of Jesus. I know there's people here in our congregation that could say, that would say, and Brian, I've, I've been hurt from the church in the past. I, I had a church that hurt me. I had a pastor that treated me the way I didn't deserve to be treated. Brian, I just can't trust anybody now. And I'm not asking you to trust me. I'm certainly not asking you to trust Hollywood Community Church. Here's what I'm asking you to trust. I'm asking you to trust Jesus. Because Jesus will respond to you with tenderness. He will respond to you with compassion. And he will respond to you with forgiveness. You can trust him. And the last thing I would say is this. Embrace his forgiveness. Embrace his forgiveness. Did, did you ever wonder, Paul, in one of these days when we get to heaven, it's going to be interesting to have a conversation with Paul. Did you ever wonder how many regrets Paul had? As Paul sat back and no doubt knew what he had done pre-conversion, how, how is Paul able to put all of that behind him? And how is Paul able to focus on being the man who God wanted him to be and accomplishing what God wanted him to accomplish? How could he do that? And Paul gives his own testimony in Philippians chapter 3 where he makes this statement, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things who are in, that are in front of us. Or are they, that lie ahead. Listen, hey, sometimes we accept the fact that God has forgiven us, but we don't forgive ourselves. And we beat ourselves up over and over again, and we never allow ourselves to be used of God. We never allow ourselves to be a vessel. We never allow ourselves, we never put ourselves in a situation where God can use us because in our mind and our heart of hearts, we feel like we're not worthy, and we beat ourselves up over and over and over and over again. Here's what I'm telling you today there is healing in forgiveness. There is healing in forgiveness. When you understand the character of God and when you understand the forgiveness of God, when you understand that God not only takes your sins and forgives them, but he casts them in the depths of the sea, Micah says, to remember them no more. And you realize that, that there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. But we are free, Galatians chapter 5 and verse tells us. The shackles would bound us no, in the past, no longer bind us. It doesn't matter what we did before we came to Jesus. Once we come to Jesus, he forgives us. And those things are in the past. And we become a new creation in Jesus Christ. Embrace your forgiveness. And accept the fact that God has forgiven you. He's redeemed you. He's changed you. As we saw last week, he has made you accepted in the beloved. You're able to enter into the very presence of God. Who are you to condemn yourself if God is not condemning you? So today, the challenge very simply is this. Accept the healing of forgiveness. Our praise team is going to come, and let me just ask you a couple of questions. So if you're here today, and you have never by faith reached out to Jesus Christ and repented of your sins. We talked about repentance last week. You've never repented of your sins, and you've never by faith turned, at, turned toward Jesus Christ, and you, you've never received that forgiveness 
Man, I'd encourage you to do that in your heart of hearts today. Maybe in your mind there was a moment that you did that and you know that you're forgiven, but you're still struggling with that on a regular basis. Embrace the hope, the healing of forgiveness today as we journey from here to the cross. We've got to realize that Jesus and Jesus alone forgives sin. And he has that balm, that medicine, that he just cleans our hearts and he makes us right with God. Accept that today. Would you stand with me with your head bowed and your eyes closed? <laughs> Father, thank you so much for the truth of your word. Father, we realize that we ourselves are unworthy. Lord, we're sinners. Some of us are good sinners. Some of us are bad sinners. But God, we're all sinners. And, and our greatest need is forgiveness. Our greatest need is to have a right relationship with God. So Lord, I pray right now that if there's someone here today that has never come to that place in their life where they realized how desperately they need Jesus, they've never repented of their sins and confessed their sins and turned to Jesus and Jesus alone to heal them. I pray that this morning they would experience that healing. Lord, I pray for others who are living under the condemnation of past failures. Help them to be able to stand free today in Jesus Christ, realizing who they are and experiencing the healing power, the healing balm of forgiveness in their lives. Father, we can't move forward in our journey till we understand that we are forgiven, that we are your children, that we are loved and we are cared for. I pray that the Holy Spirit of God would speak to each and every one of us at our point of need. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.